All right. Good morning, everyone. Please have a seat. Wow. Amazing. I mean, I know you were clamoring to get in here this morning. Uh, the faces were smiling. The energy was uh, barely controllable. And I, I think all that energy will uh, turn out uh, to be well worth the investment. And we're going to tell you a little bit about what you are going to expect today. And, from my standpoint, it's really a, a true pleasure to welcome all of you to, on this fine morning, I know you'd probably either rather be in school or outside, uh, but you're stuck here, so make the best of it. It's going to be a great, great day. Uh, I said that to the judges and our guests earlier. Uh, we shackle them. We're going to keep them here for the entire morning and into your lunch break. Uh, 
You're in, as you probably now know, the Robert H. Jackson United States Courthouse. Uh, you heard my name is William Scretney, and I'm a federal uh, court trial judge here in the Western District of New York. I was appointed by President George Herbert Walker Bush way back when, in 1990. And this courtroom is my home away from home, so to speak, uh, and it bears the name of the Buffalo Courtroom. Today, we federal judges and the uh, the federal judges are in their robes today, and I'll introduce everybody uh, before my remarks are concluded. But we have the very distinct honor of hosting you and the American Board of Trial Advocates, or ABOTA, as it's better known to most of the practicing lawyers in the area. And the program today is the fifth annual James Otis Lecture to commemorate and recognize what? Constitution Day, right? It was on September 17th, 1787, that the founders of this great nation, its 39 state delegates, voted to approve the draft of the United States Constitution. Today is 230 years and five days later, and we are all here together to celebrate this really, truly remarkable document. Our Constitution, and by the way, I don't know if you had a chance to look at uh, the glass windows in the lobby of our courthouse building, but the Constitution is etched there, all 4,543 words, seven times over. It's, uh, it's a marvel, and if you get a chance, take a look at it. You have to read it from the outside, because otherwise it's like trying to read in a mirror, and it's a little bit difficult to do. But our Constitution is an imperfect document. Uh, and you don't often hear that, but certainly it's a product of hard-fought compromises reached over the course of several summer months of debates in Philadelphia. It also is a changing and changeable document. There are, after all, and you probably know this, uh, 27 amendments. And it is those compromises that give this document its persevering power. So on this day, Friday, September 22nd, we celebrate the rights and acknowledge the imperfections of the Constitution with today's program entitled, Locked Up and Locked Out, The Arthur Duncan Second Chance Success. If that isn't an intriguing topic, I don't know what could be, so hold on to your seats, okay? Our focus is going to be, and you're going to hear about this in just a second, the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. And let me just state it very quickly, because the words are extremely important. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of what? Life? liberty or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. There's a lot encompassed in those few words. That 14th Amendment was ratified by a majority of the states on July 9th, 1868, more than 149 years ago. And that itself was almost 90 years after the enactment of the United States Constitution itself. Now, specifically in today's program, we will be considering the consequences that a person can face after committing a crime. Not the consequence of time spent in prison, which may be the first thing that comes to mind, but it's the type of lost liberty that felons face after their terms of incarceration are complete. And we do it here in our federal courthouse, which is named after Associate United States Supreme Court Justice Robert Howout Jackson. And I know you've heard a little bit about him and the naming of the courthouse from uh, Greg Peterson just a few minutes ago. And you know that Justice Jackson practiced law in Buffalo, but He's also considered by most scholars to be the best writer ever 
on the United States Supreme Court. In fact, it was Justice Jackson who wrote an enduring article on the majestic generalities of the Bill of Rights. And you know the Bill of Rights are, in effect, the first 10 amendments to the United States Constitution. And he also is renowned for a speech that he made a long time ago in 1939. And in that speech, he said that, and I quote, the most helpful sign of our times is in recognizing the primary purpose of punishment to be restoration of broken lives, end quote. That simply is a perfect segue to today's program. In a few minutes, we're going to be considering the Constitution and our rights under it on a more familiar, personal level to us all. As an aside, today's program automatically takes me back to the time when I was a law student in Washington, D.C. at Howard University Law School in the late 1960s. It was there that I experienced firsthand Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s efforts in leading the movement to ensure civil rights for all citizens of our great nation. I was also there when tragically he was assassinated in 1968. Our keynote speaker today is the Arthur Duncan. He's part of the caption title. On March 8th, 2000, now that's a day that I remember well because it also happens to be my birthday, uh, the author appeared before me and pled guilty to a drug distribution charge. Later that year, I sentenced him to 46 months incarceration in federal prison. After doing his time, on March 8th, my birthday again, 2017, exactly 17 years later, I took his, after I took his guilty plea, the Arthur appeared before me again in this courtroom, guess what, for admission to practice as an attorney in the bar of the Western District of New York. And today, he will be appearing before all of us to talk about how that remarkable and unusual series of events came to be. The Arthur is a former felon who created success against the odds, but he is the exception. Although the ongoing consequences of crime are limited by the guarantees of the United States Constitution, incarceration is rarely the end of the story for former felons who face difficulties for the rest of their lives. Professor and Vice Provost of SUNY Buffalo Law School, Teresa Miller, will speak to you about some of those potential difficulties and whether they are fair and appropriate. You should know before we begin that a lot of hard work make today possible, including the efforts of your teachers, the administration at your schools, and our own court and technical staff. Hard work also from today's speakers, whose discussions I am certain will prove insightful and enlightening. You will also hear today briefly from Barbara Schiffling, president of the Buffalo chapter of ABODA. Greg Peterson may add an additional word or two, and he, as you know, is the co-founder of the Justice Jackson Center in Jamestown. And ABODA's own Michael Purley, he's synonymous with ABODA. Without Mike's efforts, uh, this day in court and the last five programs uh, would be, in point of fact, non-existent. So thank you, Michael. We have a number of esteemed judges, and you can tell. I mean, they're a very, very distinguished lot. Uh, the judges in the robes are uh, in robes because this is our home. This is our federal courthouse. We are all federal judges. Seated in the witness stand is um, Judge Lawrence Villardo. He's our newest judge. I think he worked on the Constitution back in 1787, but I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have in front of me uh, individuals whom I think you have heard at least their names. Uh, I won't go into any of their backgrounds, but uh, U.S. Magistrate Jeremiah McCarthy. Judge McCarthy, if you can at least raise your hand, just so they know. Okay. Uh, Magistrate Judge Michael Romer, and none other than you know, U.S. Magistrate Judge Leslie Fascio. 
and a Hutch Tech alum. You know, the guy thrives on applause, so give him another round, okay? <laughs> Let me tell you why, you know, I think this is very special, and it's mainly because of the assistance that we're going to get from our state bench, and honestly, we're blown away by your eagerness to share your experiences and your time in your effort with us today. We've never had a turnout like this, and uh, it, it means a great deal, not only to us on the federal bench, uh, but to our system of justice, to know that our judges are engaged in trying to put together an effort so that we all understand what our Constitution is all about, what our society should be. And we couldn't do it without the high caliber of judges that we have in our state system. I'd like to introduce them if I can. I'll do my best. Uh, the gentleman that's uh, leading the pack, so to speak, is uh, the former judge from our state's highest court, the Court of Appeals, uh, Eugene Pigott, Jr., Judge Pigott. Uh, seated, seated next to him is um, Appellate Justice Aaron Peridotto. Uh, her name actually is on the ballot, I think, uh, this year. Uh, uh, next to uh, Judge Peridotto is uh, uh, Judge Shirley Troutman from the Appellate Division as well. And uh, Judge Troutman and I go back a long time to the, ago to the DA's office and uh, fond memories then. Likewise with uh, Judge Jeanette Ogden, most of you probably know or have heard of both of them. Um, Let's see, Judge Betty Calvo-Torres is uh, next, and her name is on the ballot, and uh, she's out there campaigning, but took time to join us today, and we're really glad she's here. Uh, let's see, Judge Egan, uh, Susan Egan, is on the ballot as well. She's uh, on the county court ballot. Thank you for being here. Uh, Judge Barbara Johnson-Lee uh, is here, and uh, I, of course I met, I missed, uh, did I miss Jahar Prigen, uh, Judge Prigen? How do I, why do I do that? All right, thank you. Uh, it's good to see you uh, this morning. And um, then in the top row, I don't know how she managed to get that seat, is City Court Judge Amy Martocci. Why don't you give them a round of applause, okay, please? You know, I, sincerely and again, I can't thank you enough to sharing with us your time and your effort this morning. Uh, they will be joining us, as you know, for lunch. You get lunch. It's part of the deal. Uh, after the presentations, then everybody will be around to engage with you, answer questions, discuss anything that you might feel is relevant to your lives and where you're going in this country. And you know we have our issues. We have our problems. But it's a great country. And if we can help you with anything, please, please let us know. So much awaits you. And I'm not going to take up any more time. I eagerly invite at this point none other than a board of President Barbara Schiffling uh, to the lectern to get our program started. Barbara, if you would, please. Welcome. I'm Barbara Schieffling, current president of the local ABOTA chapter. ABOTA means American Board of Trial Advocates. To be a member, you have to prove that you have tried to a verdict a certain number of cases, a sort of large number of cases, and you have to have a good, good ethics. And the local chapter votes on you, and then it goes to the national office, and they have to approve you. So what does a BOTA do? It promotes jury trials. It promotes programs like today, where people are learning about the Constitution and our uh, legal rights. It encourages lawyers to be civil to each other and to the court. Uh, we plan programs to help lawyers become more skilled at their craft. We put on mock trials and other programs, sometimes bringing in uh, quite famous lawyers from around the country to demonstrate in a courtroom such as this 
how to cross-examine or how to put on a witness, uh, things like that. We started an affiliate organization at UB Law School with students who want to become trial lawyers. And we help, we encourage them to come and watch trials, and also we encourage them to uh, learn the rules of civility so they know how to properly treat judges, other litigants, and other attorneys. And sometimes we honor people in the court system who've done a great job of helping lawyers. As a Judge Scretney told you, the Otis Lecture that you're here for today is in its fifth year. And Judge Scretney is the leader of this. And we thank him very much for his hard work and for allowing our, all of us to use his courtroom and for taking an interest in you and in this program. Like many good things in life, the Otis Lecture comes to fruition because of collaboration. Judge Scretney and his court, the other judges who will discuss the legal issues with you during lunch, Greg Peterson and the Jackson Center for all their help, UB Law professors this year, Professor Teresa Miller, and today the author Duncan, this year who will share his story with you, and a Boda. And for purposes of the Otis Lecture, that is Mike Purley. So we are grateful to all of you for being here. We're grateful for your teachers to help you get here. And we know that you will uh, thank all of these people who made it possible at lunch. But last but not least, we, are welcome, we welcome you and we are grateful for you to be here. And most important of all, we're grateful for your attention. So welcome and enjoy. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, the gentleman walking up to the podium right now, we had to find a slot for him. Uh, but we had to find one where he didn't talk too long. Yeah, and uh, so we decided we'd give him the assignment to introduce uh, the keynote speaker, if you will, from the University of Buffalo Law School, Greg Peterson, from uh, the co-founder of the Jackson Center and a practicing lawyer with Phillips Lytle uh, here in the city. Your Honor, judges, I had the distinct pleasure of introducing Professor Teresa Miller, who is the Professor of Law, Vice Provost for Equity and Inclusion at the SUNY University at Buffalo School of Law. Heard from me earlier today uh, about Robert H. Jackson. She graduated with John Barrett, who is the biographer of Robert H. Jackson. In 2014, uh, Professor Miller enjoyed a distinguished career as a professor of law specializing in immigration law, criminal procedure, and prisoner of law. Her long-standing commitment to equity and social jurisdiction justice has been demonstrated throughout her academic career by her leadership as a member of the ABA task force that rewrote the standards on the legal status of prisoners in 2010. Her decades-long involvement in prison reform in New York State, her scholarship on the convergence of immigration law and criminal punishment, and her engagement with issues of mass incarceration as a documentary filmmaker, soon to be the next Ken Burns on immigration law. I, we look forward to her presentation on Locked Up and Locked Out Post-Release Obstacles into the Society. Professor Miller. Thank you very much, Greg. I want to first say I see bright young people sitting at these desks that council occupy, and I, and I see all of you um, in the pews, and I'm hoping that someday soon, right, you'll be in this courtroom occupying these seats, representing clients. That would be fabulous. Um, 
I'm delighted to celebrate Constitution Day with you here in the Robert H. Jackson Federal Courthouse and delighted that the topic is one that is so relevant to issues, critical, critical issues of opportunity and inclusion uh, that touch Buffalo, they touch Western New York, and they touch communities like ours um, every day. So in about 10 minutes, I'm going to try to frame for you uh, some key issues surrounding uh, civil penalties. Uh, th these penalties uh, that complete, that often um, challenge the ability of people uh, to re-enter society when they have uh, fel felony convictions. So I, in, in my career as a law professor, um, have toured and ex inspected uh, about half of the 54 prisons in New York State. Um, and I've uh, been the advisor to the lifers group at Attica State Prison. Um, I was doing that for about a decade. Uh, and about 12 years ago, uh, produced a volume on uh, called Civil Penalty Social Consequences. So I spent a lot of time thinking about these penalties and how they impact ex-offenders and society. Um, and I should say, uh, I think one of the things that's really important about understanding the Constitution is understanding uh, that even though it was penned many years ago, uh, it remains the foundation of our government, the foundation of the kind of assumptions that we have about how we run our society. So think about the people who founded the country, who um, wrote the Constitution, uh, even the people who amended the Constitution. Could they imagine that we would have the society that we have today? You know, not could they imagine smartphones, because I know they couldn't, but could, could they imagine the number of people who would be in the criminal justice system, right? The number of people who would be in society um, after having uh, served time in, a, in a, a state or federal correctional facility. You know, that's, I, I think the relevance of the Constitution is its ability uh, to help us really grapple with and measure uh, these uh, consequences um, and 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 apply them so that you know that it, that it it fosters um, a reentry and reintegration in society instead of impedes it. All right. So I have two children and well, two young people in high school, uh, a freshman and a junior, and I, I thought about what 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 would make civil collateral penalties, right? These post-release obstacles relevant to them. So um, indulge me for a second and think about a penalty you might be subject to. I mean, um, say um, you made a bad decision. I mean, a seriously bad decision, not like a bad fashion decision, right? But um, say your friends convinced you to liberate a copy of the history exam, um, or um, say, um, you play a prank um, on uh, some of the new kids being inducted in the honor society, and one ends up falling, right, and getting seriously injured. Uh, uh, say, or say you're repeatedly caught smoking on the grounds of the school. How might you be punished, right? Well, let's think about punishment. You might be removed from school for a time, right? Um, that's out of school suspension. You might be removed from your classmates in school. Um, in school suspension, you might be required to do community service. You might have a behavioral intervention plan, right? And then think about what your parents would do, right? Because that's just the school, right? What would your parents do? Well, they might, you know, ground you. They might say you can't be with your friends. They take your phone away. Um, and you might have punishing chores at home, right? So these are, uh, uh, punishment, some, you know, if you, if you ask why you're being punished in one of these manners or through a combination of these methods, um, uh, you might think about, and your parents, of course, are thinking about, you know, what the purposes of punishment are. And I'm going to skip to, yeah, there we go. Um, would, it's it, to teach you a lesson, right, to make you think about the consequences of your actions so you don't make similar mistakes in the future. That would be to deter your conduct, right? Uh, to prevent you, in the sh at least in the short term, from making another seriously bad decision, right? Before you've sort of learned your lesson. That would be which of these? You're looking at the screens, you tell me. 
Exactly, incapacitation, right? We're going to lock you down for a minute, right? Um, what about uh, to inculcate or instill new patterns of behavior in you? Excellent, rehabilitation. Well, this one, what about this one? To, to, to give you your just desserts, right? An eye for an eye. You know, you did wrong. And so, retribution. Oh, you guys are sharp and on it. So, you know, <laughs> so, you know now imagine that you have completed your uh, punishment, uh, that there are a range of consequences, many of which you maybe never knew about, that you're subject to, in some cases, for the rest of your life. And these consequences prevent you from effectively rejoining your school community, uh, participating in your friend group, or prospering. Right? Imagine that you become subject to rules that have nothing to do for atoning for the bad decision you made. They weren't designed to teach you a lesson or help you learn from your mistake, yet these, tool, these, these punishments, right, these rules create consequences that limit your ability to move forward, to prosper, to thrive. Um, they continue your punishment long after you have paid your debt to society. Now, what would that look like? Because um, I know none of you all, you know, you're all uh, in academic superstars and headed for an amazing future, right? So I'm not going to assume that you know anything about the criminal justice system. But let's say uh, after you made this bad decision and were punished, uh, you apply for a driver's license. And you're asked, were you ever disciplined in school? Oh, if you are, you're not eligible for a driver's license, right? Licenses are one of the collateral uh, penalties we're going to talk about. Uh, imagine when you turn 18, you try to register to vote, and you're told, oh, no, you're, you're, you're ineligible because you were well, disciplined in school, right? Or imagine you apply to college, right, as all of you will be doing. Um, you have to check a box, right? Were you ever disciplined in school? Um, and, and you know in the back of your mind, you know, if I check that box, what's going to happen to my application? Um, and, and I should note, the SUNY system, the State University of New York system, just eliminated, they banned the box from all their college admissions, uh, undergraduate and graduate school uh, admissions. And they did that because they felt like when you've you know, served your time, when you have finished out your sentence, it shouldn't be a bar to the opportunity to get an education, particularly since education plays such an enormous role in, in creating more opportunities uh, for, for young people, for everyone. All right, so what's a collateral civil penalty? Well, we know a penalty is a disadvantage, a loss due to some action, often a violation of a rule. Collateral means sort of runs alongside, collateral, right, running alongside secondary, ancillary. So it's not the main penalty, it runs alongside the penalty. And civil means the penalty is itself not a part of the formal criminal sentence. So collateral civil penalties are these penalties or disadvantages imposed upon a person as a result of a criminal conviction, either automatically by operation of law or authorized action of an administrative agency or court on a case-by-case -case basis. There are lots of different forms of civil collateral penalties. Um, uh, the ones that are most well known, and raise your show of hands if you've heard of, well, and I know you've had Mr. Perley's lecture, so you, you should have heard of most of these, right? Felon disenfranchisement, right? Okay, that means what? Can't vote, Can't vote right? Um, what about uh, denial or revocation of occupational or professional licenses? Did you all know that's a consequence of, did you? So that's what uh, Mr. Duncan is going to be talking about uh, in part today, about his, in his journey, um, how you deal with that denial revocation of a professional license. There's also loss of the ability to own a gun, deportation. Did he, how many of you knew that a consequence of a felony conviction is if you're not a US citizen, you are deportable? Raise your hand high if you knew that. OK. That's a really serious consequence, right? Because it means you have to pack your things leave the country, often either leaving folks behind or having to gather them up and take them. And they may never have lived in the country that you're from. Also, denial of social benefits, um, particularly to felony drug offenders. And that's things like eligibility for food stamps, cash assistance. Um, it, it could be ineligibility for federal financial aid for college and exclusion from public housing. 
So the, there, are, there are a few more, but these are kind of the major categories of these uh, civil collateral penalties. Um, and uh, the ones that you know, Im impose uh, often burdens that have to be overcome after you serve your time. You know, so I think the important thing to know about these penalties, right, because I can't do justice to the complexity of the legal and policy issues raised by them in my growing, short, or ever, ever shorter 10 minutes to talk with you today. Um, but I can tell you, I can give you the broad strokes that frame the context of Mr. Duncan's inspiring and, in my opinion, heroic story. Um, uh, and, and I had the pleasure of, of did, was, did you ever take a class with me? Yeah, yeah, we, of being his professor um, at, at UB Law School. Um, so lo laws creating these uh, penalties, right, were, um, they have been in existence for a long time, uh, particularly when you think about um, uh, disenfranchisement. Um, they, they started off in um, English, European, and Roman law, were imported into the states and their constitutions in the 1700s and 1800s. They played an important role in the U.S. during the post-Reconstruction era when southern states expanded felony disenfranchisement provisions as part of a larger strategy to disenfranchise the large population of emancipated black people in the South. Um, have any of you all studied pig laws? Do you know what they are? Ooh, I see some hands. I did, where was that hand over here? So pig laws were laws that were passed, right, after a slavery ended, that heightened the penalties for certain very predictable offenses. So when a whole bunch of people who've been held as property, right, are suddenly now um, considered people, right, and, and excuse me, and no longer do they have, they're no longer f uh, held on, on plantations, right? So they've got to find work. And it's very predictable that one of the things that people who, um, uh, who are in that situation do is uh, steal to, um, to support themselves. So theft of a pig gets an enormous penalty that then puts them into uh, the prison system in the South, which in turn, uh, it's a complicated history. You should read about it. It's fascinating. But essentially, um, uh, uh, the, the prison system in the South often operated right, as, a, um, as a pool of labor. Uh, so ex-plantation owners would say, I'll operate your prison because, you know, it's kind of a mess and, you know, and, and that's the origin of chain gangs and things. So it's complicated, but in that complicated history, disenfranchisement, right, is this penalty that gets tacked on because what does the power to vote give you? Okay, I like that, it's true. I mean, uh, the, much of the Supreme Court yeah, absolutely agrees with you. But it, it gives you the, what, what, what does it allow you to do? It allows, I'm uh, sorry, I thought I heard it. Hmm? It, it. It gives you a voice, right? And in having that voice, right, you can elect people, right, and, and, and through elections address issues. Um, you can elect people who, uh, that have solutions to your problem, that, that, that have the perspective that, um, that you would like to see uh, presented on a range of issues, right? But it, it, voting is the key to all the other rights. Um, and so to, to disenfranchise people means that they cannot have a voice, which means they can't vote to change maybe some of the criminal laws that create you know, a mass incarceration, right? Or create systems in which many, many people are being um, uh, put in prison. So um, more recently, uh, these penalties have come under greater scrutiny during the war on drugs, right? And you may, how many of you raised a show of hands have heard of the Rockefeller drug laws? Ooh, really? Sort of the beginning of this, so started the war on drugs, 1973, right here in New York State, right? The first uh, mandatory minimum sentences, right? So what happened during this war on drugs? Well, the length and the breadth and the severity of criminal pe penalties was expanded, um, along with criminal law enforcement budgets. So many more people were subjected to these civil penalties. 
right? So if, for example, um, between 1970 and 2005, 700% increase in the prison population. You know, we are the, you know, we, we incarcerate at a rate greater than any other country. Um, another thing that happened was this popular sort of tough on crime measures, right? So in, in, the, in the 80s and 90s, we see lots of civil laws, right? Legislators passing lots of civil laws saying, oh, if you're a drug felon, you can't get this, you can't get public housing, you, you might lose, you know, to, uh, uh, a, um, ASPA, mm -hmm. Adoption and Safe Families Act, you might lose your children, right? Your parental rights might be terminated. So there's a, not only are there more people that are going to a system that, sub, that subjects you to these penalties, but the, the penalties themselves are getting sort of harsher, right? In 1939, when Justice Jackson was the Solicitor General of the United States, um, his deep concern for justice led him to write the following uh, federal probation reporter article, I mean, the, the following passage in a federal probation reporter article uh, called Striking at the Roots of Crime. He said, the most difficult time in the restoration of the convict is to use, uh, is, to make him useful uh, immediately after the prison doors are opened. The law has been satisfied. He has his freedom. But where is he to find work or welcome? What doors are open to him? In whose company may he find society and companionship? Without these, he cannot regain a foothold in the world. And I think that's really the story of, of these penalties. Right? It, it, it's regaining a foothold. Um, and the proliferation of them has made it far more difficult. Doesn't mean it can't be done. Um, and what's so inspiring about Mr. Duncan's story is that he did it, right? And he'll tell you more about that. As a policy matter, um, there are a few things uh, I just want to uh, raise. Proportionality, right? Are these penalties proportionate? Um, many of these restrictions, like right, you think about deportation, you're leaving the country. That may be much more harsh than the criminal sentence that you served, right? Three years in prison, you, you serve it, you get out. Deportation, you don't get to come back, right? Loss of parental rights, right? When you're incarcerated, your children go into the foster care system, you potentially lose your parental rights. What about the, the concept of notice? Do you know these consequences? Um, as you all know from Mr. Perley's presentation, right, the American Bar Association has identified more than 46,000 collateral consequences in laws and ordinances across the US. Until this ABA project, most of these penalties weren't even known or cataloged. Right? They get passed, ordinances get passed, um, state it's legislators pass uh, laws, uh, uh, Congress people and senators pass laws, and it's, they're not always codified or put somewhere where you can see them. So they come as a surprise. Uh, as one of these penalties can be triggered by an action as mundane as traveling out of the state to a county in a different state. Because, um, 46 jurisdictions require an ex-offender to register with local law enforcement um, if you're there for more than a couple of days. Um, so you can, so that's the notice, uh, the notice means, you know, what the surprise, right? The element of surprise, not knowing they're there. An another issue is that they're often loosely related to the danger that they, you know, that the person poses. Right? So, you know, you can imagine in some instances, and they'll talk about character and fitness more for the, for the bar, um, you can see where, well, we need to look closer and understand the circumstances and, you know, and so you're subject to a separate process before you can be allowed to get a uh, license to practice law. Um, but you can also, for an, a felony, you can not get a barber license. Um, not get a license to be a dental hygienist, a nurse, a midwife. Um, and that leads to revolving door incarceration, right? Or this idea that um, the penalties can be so great that often they drive people to do things that lead them back to prison, right? And we don't, you know, as a society, that's not a good thing. Um, so it really requires that we think carefully about 
making sure these penalties are kind of what the founders in, in, you know, envisioned our, our criminal justice, are consistent with what they envisioned our criminal justice system to be. And, and ultimately, they, ask, they raise the question of, you know, do we have second chances? Do we allow people second chances in society? And you're going to hear a lot more about that in just a minute from uh, Mr. Duncan. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Miller. That was, I mean, just excellent. I mean, it was a perfect setting of the stage for what's yet to come in this particular program. You know, there's an art to the profession of teaching, and that's to make sometimes difficult concepts very understandable. And certainly, Professor Miller did that. I mean, how would you like to be your kids, right? I mean, there's no wiggle room, no wiggle room in whatever it is that she told them. Uh, and, uh, you know, we got the message. We, uh, we understand, uh, I think, a great deal more about uh, the consequences and collateral consequences. Uh, and we thank you very much for joining us today, Professor. One more round of applause. Thank you. I think in that mix in the presentation, you heard the word jurisdiction. And uh, I, I think it's appropriate, because you are in a federal courthouse, that we tell you a little bit about federal court in the process and uh, the jurisdictional structure of our court. Uh, and I think the, the person that's probably the best to do that uh, in the shortest number of words is our newest U.S. magistrate, uh, Michael Romer. Uh, Mr. Romer, if you take the podium, just so you know, before he was a federal magistrate, uh, and since he's become one, he had a full head of hair when he started. Uh, things have changed. Okay, Mr. Romer, Judge Romer. Thank you, Judge Scretany. Uh, Judge Scretany is my boss, and one of the things I really like about him is he's always given me chances to excel. <laughs> and so my chance today is to describe for you in great detail the federal court system in five minutes or less. So uh, let's get started. Uh, during Mr. Purley's presentation to you this week, he discussed uh, with you the Supreme Court, which, is, which of course is the highest and most important court in the land. But district courts, like our district court here, is where much of the action happens. There are 94 district courts throughout the country. District courts are the trial courts, or the, low, the first level courts of the three level federal court system. The district courts are where federal cases are commenced. Civil cases, which were in civil cases, one party suing another party, usually for money damages, they begin with the filing of a complaint. And they are generally resolved in one of three ways. The district judge decides that one party is entitled to win as a matter of law. That's one way it's resolved. A second way it could be resolved is with a trial in which a jury determines which side should win. And the third way that the uh, cases are resolved is the parties agree to settle the case. They come to an agreement uh, for a dollar amount or that something should be done, and that's how the case ends. Criminal cases are initiated by the filing of either an indictment or a complaint and are usually resolved by the defendant either pleading guilty or by the defendant going to trial to have a jury determine the defendant's guilt or innocence. Now our court, the Western District of New York, which is where you are sitting right now, is made up of the 17 most western counties of New York. The court sits both here in Buffalo and in Rochester. Cases are supervised by district judges, like Judge Scretany, and magistrate judges, like myself. Federal district judges are nominated and appointed for life by the President of the United States, subject to confirmation by the Senate. This way, they cannot be removed merely because they decide a case in a way that some people might disagree with. Magistrate judges, such as myself, are appointed by the district judges for a term of eight years and assist the district judges in resolving cases. We oversee pretrial proceedings in both criminal and civil matters. We issue decisions and recommendations that shape the scope of the case. And sometimes we resolve a case from start to finish. Every day in our country, people are arrested and brought into district courts like this one for arraignment, hearings, trials, and sentencings if they are ultimately found guilty. After serving their sentences, defendants are often placed on a term of supervised release, meaning that they are still under the supervision of the court. 
Some defendants who are at high risk of committing further crimes or violating the terms of their release go through what we call reentry court, over which the magistrate judges have the honor to preside. Here in Buffalo, Magistrate Judge Hugh Scott supervises the reentry court, and in Rochester, Magistrate Judge John, John Feldman supervises. I'm the designated substitute. When one of them can't make it, I fill in for them. The reentry court is designed to assist participants with their transition back to society. These high risk defendants have historically, historically demonstrated an increased rate of violation proceedings before a district court judge. These defendants provide an ongoing challenge for the US probation office and the court. By providing judicial oversight and early intervention, reentry court has the potential to reduce the number of revocation proceedings before district judges, improve participants' compliance with conditions of super supervised release, and decrease the chance that they will commit further crimes. Studies show that the reentry court participants respond positively if a judge takes an interest in their success. In addition, frequent appearances before the judicial officer coupled with the knowledge of predictable and targeted consequences for failure, assist the participant in taking the steps necessary to get his or her life back on track. If a party to a criminal or civil case thinks there has been an error in their case, they can appeal that decision to the next level, the Court of Appeals. Like the district courts, which represent geographic portions of the country, appellate courts and the federal judiciary are split into circuits each hearing appeals from certain designated locations in the country. In our part of the country, appeals are heard by the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York City, which hears cases from all over the state of New York, Connecticut, and Vermont. In total, there are 13 courts of appeals in our country. Decisions from those 13 courts of appeals can be challenged in our highest court, the Supreme Court, which is located in Washington, D.C., and consists of nine justices. Cases can also reach the Supreme Court from a state court. If the decision of a state court's highest court is challenged, that challenge may also be heard in the Supreme Court. I thank you for your time and hope you enjoy your day here at the courthouse, and I do believe I was under five minutes. All right. Thank you, Mark. Judge Weber, thank you very much, and that was a great primer. Uh, I understand the process a little bit better now. <laughs> uh, and I, I want to thank, again, my federal colleagues, because, I mean, they've all uh, agreed to be here and share uh, the floor with our state brethren. Uh, and, uh, you know, Mr. R Judge Wilmer mentioned uh, the uh, reentry court, uh, which is a very critical part of what uh, our criminal administrative process is here in federal court. And there are versions of that, multiple versions of that in city court, county court, Supreme Court, at the state level. Uh, but that tailors and is tracked into, uh, I, I think, the change in the way we look at criminal prosecutions and rehabilitation uh, and uh, mass incarceration and consequences of that. And it goes back to what Justice Jackson said back in 1939, and that is that punishment uh, purpose is the rest of, uh, it should be and is the restoration of broken lives. And that's what we try to address because it's so important to our society. There's so much that we have to meet, uh, so much that we're confronted with, so much that we have to improve upon. But if we have that little assist, through a program like the reentry court, it can make all the difference. And our keynote speaker will tell you a little bit about the difference uh, that that kind of an approach has made in his life. Uh, okay, uh, the next person is the person you've heard about from start to finish in this program, other than the, uh, the Arthur Duncan, and that's Michael Perley. And Mr. Perley, if you could join us, please. He's the driving force behind uh, our program, not only this year, but has been for the four previous years, this being our fifth year. Uh, he's a, uh, a top lawyer in our community. Uh, he's committed to uh, the uh, integration of uh, practical legal uh, 
uh, education and the everyday lives of students. I mean, he's very active in uh, bringing in students so that you're better prepared when you go out as adults into the real world, so to speak. Uh, he's committed to that. He's very uh, highly respected in our uh, legal community. Uh, I think you will enjoy hearing from uh, Mr. Perley as he introduces the Arthur Duncan this afternoon. Mr. Thank Perley. You, thank you, Mr. Your Honor, thank you for those kind remarks. May it please the court. It is my privilege today to uh, introduce the Arthur Duncan. Uh, I met the Arthur Duncan in this courtroom on March 8th of 2017. It so happened that on that date, I was moving the admission of an associate in our office to the practice uh, in this court. Uh, and I think Judge Scretany keeps statistics on this, and I'm, uh, I am successful in that motion at least uh, about 50% of the time. I, think that's... I don't think he was that high, Mr. Perley. <laughs> so here, here's what happened, and I'll try to make this brief. I, you have to check in with the clerk's office, and we come up here, and, and we're waiting uh, for the proceedings to begin. And there's another fellow comes up to me, he's an attorney, and he said to, he said to me, is uh, the judge going to be on time? I looked at him and I said, well, I've been practicing law for 40 years and I've never once had a judge be late. So I think you'll be on time no matter what time he arrives. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out that Judge Scretany took the bench uh, very promptly that day. However, that individual was the attorney moving the Arthur Duncan's admission into practice in this court. And I got to know Thea Arthur that day, and I was thrilled to death that we had the opportunity to hear from him today and to present him as part of this lecture series. Uh, it is a tremendous uh, story of, uh, of overcoming significant obstacles, including, and, and as I've told all of you in, in the classes, he had to go to law school, and he didn't get into UB originally. And as an individual with a wife and family, he drove to Cleveland to go to law school and came back to Buffalo until he was finally admitted at UB. After he passed the bar, he had to pass the Character and Fitness Committee. One of my colleagues on the Character and Fitness Committee is Judge Ogden. Our committee looked at his application and passed him, and then after that, and only after that, was he eligible to be admitted into federal court, and Judge Scrutiny had uh, the opportunity to do that on the same day that I was here. Once again, I was thrilled when we, uh, as a group, and there's a committee that does all this, uh, when we as a committee decided that the Arthur Duncan story was the story that we should tell you this year. Um, may I present the Arthur Duncan. Good morning, everyone. How are we doing? This program is great. Um, I, first of all, I want to say good morning to all the distinguished judges, um, guests, and students. It is my honor to be the speaker today. And so let's get to it. Um, as we know, th this day we're celebrating this for the Constitution Day. And um, as we know, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And in the Constitution, we have amendments. Wait, wait, I can hear me. And in amendments, to be deprived of life, liberty, and property, you have to go through a due process of law. What is that due process of law? Now, for this event, for this speech, and this this proceedings, we're focusing on the criminal aspect of that process of law. Now, the process of law, as we know, we have three branches in the government. We have the, the legislative, who makes the laws, the judicial, who interprets the law, and executive, who enforces the laws. So as a criminal aspect of this, you will have certain penalties that the legislative branch gives to individuals that break criminal laws. Then they have their day in court in the judicial branch, and accordingly the judge sentences them if they're found guilty of that crime. 
And you have the in executive branch, which is the police department and the prisons, who the police arrest you when you violate these laws, and accordingly, you go to prison once you're sentenced. Now, again, I want you to think about this with me. If the due process of law assigns a certain time and penalty to the crime that you've committed, once you've served that time, once that penalty that you impose is over, as an example, you get sentenced to five years in prison. You do your five years in prison and you're released back to society. Again, you cannot be deprived of life, liberty, and property without due process of law. So after you've went through this due process, this due process and completed that accordingly, shouldn't that amendment apply it back to you again? Yes. It should, shouldn't it? However, the law also categorizes crimes. And the most severe crime is a felony. And it also, once you're convicted of this felony, you're now characterized as a felon. With that, there's certain things that you cannot do. That's where I come in. Let's give you a little history about me. I'm originally from Los Angeles, California, raised primarily in Buffalo. I went back out to Los Angeles in the 80s. And I don't know if you guys seen Straight Outta Compton. Um, I was out there during that time in the late 80s. And the gang violence was very prevalent. Um, I lived in a blood neighborhood, but I went to school with Crips. So I was constantly going from one color to the next color, trying to talk my way out of getting killed. I had a um, gangbanger put a knife to my throat and take my jacket on the bus. And on top of that, this was the 80s when the crack cocaine and what they call the free basin back then, when the cocaine epidemic hit South Central LA. Now, while I'm having these issues out in the streets with the gangbangers, my stepfather developed a drug addiction. And he started um, abusing my mother and stealing everything. And it got so bad that the gangbangers threatened to kill my mother and him if his drug debt wasn't paid. So we were able to raise some money and pay his drug debt. I taste my mouth, so I was ready to leave. Everybody asked me, you from LA, what are you doing in Buffalo? Well, this is how I got back to Buffalo. But I was kind of raised here every other year because my grandparents here, so I was back and forth. So I came back to Buffalo at age 19 and started hanging out with the guys I knew from elementary school in my neighborhood. And the funny story was we were playing basketball one day and we walked down to the corner and um, smoking a little weed and stuff, having a few beers. And this older guy came up to one of my friends and asked him for a dime. And I'm thinking to myself, why is this old man asking my friend for some change? You y'all with me? <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't asking him for no change. So my friend went around the corner to an alley, came back around, handed the guy a package of crack, and he gave him $10. And I looked at my friend, and I was like, yo. Y'all hustling? They was like, yeah, Tone, because they call me Tone on the street, so. Yeah, Tone, we out here getting this money. And I told myself, oh my God. Oh, after what I went through in LA because of drugs, I was basically trying to get away from that and ran right into it. And I told myself I wouldn't never sell any drugs. 
And my grandfather was a minister, and I was in his house, and it was something I would never do. But I kept hanging around these guys. I knew them since elementary school, and they started to buy me stuff, and I'm hanging out with them. And sooner or later, first I started off selling marijuana, and then I started selling crack. And I believe I sold crack on the streets of Buffalo for a good eight to 10 years. And I can't believe I'm saying this in a room full of judges. <laughs> but statute of limitation has expired. <laughs> yeah. Judge Scrutiny promised me immunity with anything I said today. So anyways, fast forward, it was something I knew I was dead wrong doing, and I would tell myself I'm going to stop, I'm going to stop, but I would never stop. I used different reasons to justify what I was doing. I had my oldest son, I had to take care of him, so I just kept selling drugs. And I mean, I'm not going to lie, I was young, I enjoyed the life, traveling, New York City, Atlanta, Miami, partying, um, drinking, this, not a care in the world. But as we know, it caught up to me. So one morning at 6 a.m., I got a knock on my door, and it was the federal authorities. And I was arrested along with my brother, my cousin, and my aunt, and I believe about 20 other individuals on a conspiracy charge. Now, as you know, it was said before, and I think it was about 17 and a half years ago, in a courtroom, in the old federal courtroom across the street, this evil judge sentenced me to 46 months in federal prison <laughs> by the name of William Scratney. Now, I may be kidding about the evil part, but I hope did. so. <laughs> <laughs> but he did sentence me to 46 months in federal prison. Uh, this is me in Allenwood Federal Prison with a couple of guys I was in jail with. This is me and my brother taking a picture in Allenwood. And that's me and my oldest son. As you can see, that picture kind of um, gets to me. I said, I started not to put it up there. But I felt like I had deserted him. And all the material things that I was giving him as a drug dealer, now I was absent from his life. But again, I survived prison, luckily. And I got out of prison, and I had to do six months in the halfway house. And now I'm thinking, what am I going to do with myself? I told myself, I'm not going back to prison. I'm not going back to Buffalo to sell drugs. But what am I going to do with myself? All I had was a high school diploma, no job skills, because I never really worked. And now I have this stigma as a felon. What am I going to do? It would be so easy for me to do what I knew. And what's that? Go back to selling drugs. That's, that would have been the easy route. So in the halfway house, they require you to find a job. Now, on top of all these things I just told you, they make it even harder because they make you, when you go look for a job, you have to have this piece of paper. And it says that I'm in Buffalo Halfway House and I'm looking for a job and I was here and they want you to get a signature. Now on top of the felony, the no job skills, um, now I gotta give you a piece of paper and say I'm in the halfway house, will you hire me? Needless to say, that wasn't easy. And as a matter of fact, on one occasion, I filled out an application at um, 
Kaufman's is used is, is now Macy's, and the lady interviewed me at the um, at 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 the spot on the spot, and she asked me about my felony conviction, and she asked me what was it for, and I tried to use the big words all oh, um, conspiracy to intent to control substance, like I was talking over her head. She was like, you were selling drugs? <laughs> and I said, well, that's not my um, conviction. It's for conspiracy to obtain and distribute. She was like, no, you were selling drugs. <laughs> and I was like, I guess something like that. And then she said, um, well, who are you selling drugs to? I mean, she was just all in my business. So I said, never mind. And I got up. And as I was walking away, she threw my application in the garbage. So I knew this was something that was almost going to be something that was going to be happening to me repeatedly. So I said, what can I do to help myself in this situation? Now, I was always smart. I was like so smart in school that um, people used to copy off my paper in class, so I used to write the wrong answer, let them copy it, and then they turn it in, and then I rewrite the right answer. But I didn't, I didn't want to be the smart kid. I wanted to be the cool kid. I wanted to play basketball. I wanted to be a rapper. I wanted to sell drugs. I wanted to be in the in crowd, and that landed me in federal prison. So now, let me go back to my A game, as I say. I was always smart, honor roll, all the time, never studied. So I said, maybe if I can get a degree, get some letters behind my name, that can deflect this felony. So I said, let me enroll into ECC. So I tried to enroll in ECC, and guess what? Because of my felony, they wouldn't accept me. So now I'm trying to educate myself as a felon when I get out of jail, and this community college wouldn't accept me. So I called, and I called, and I tried, and so finally they said, um, we need a letter from your probation officer, and then we're going to put you in front of this committee and see if we let you in. So I got into ECC. And um, I was fortunate, I got close to a professor by the name of Dr. Grabner. And I had him for two classes, and I was doing well in his classes. And he asked me, he said, The Arthur, what are you going to do after you get your associates? And I felt comfortable enough telling him, I said, Well, Dr. Grabner, I always wanted to be an attorney, but I can't. He said, You can't? What do you mean you can't? You're a smart individual. I believe you can. I said, No, I can't. I'm a convicted felon, and I just did three years in federal prison. And he said, well, does being a felon stop you from practicing law in New York State? And because of that stigma of being a felon, I assume that it did. Sidebar, don't assume anything. Don't listen to what they say. Do the research. It's just like going to a doctor. If you hear something from someone and it don't sound right, seek a second opinion. I assumed that I couldn't become an attorney and I was, would have not went this dire direction if not for this professor. Now, I believe God put him in my life so I would go this direction but he's the individual that looked into it for me. So he comes back to me and he says, well, the Arthur, I have good news and I have bad news. And I said, well, what's the good news? He said, the good news is that there's not an absolute bar to becoming an attorney in New York State with a felony. So I was like, great, so what's the bad news? He said, well, the bad news is that um, down the line, you're going to have to go in front of this character and fitness committee. And they can tell you no. And there's no way you can know beforehand whether they're going to let you practice or not. So you're going to have to graduate, get your associates, get your bachelors, 
the bachelor's degree, go to law school and graduate from law school, take and pass the New York State Bar, amass all this student debt, which I know we can all attest to, and when you get in front of this committee, which is comprised of local lawyers and judges, they can tell you no. And it's basically a seven to eight year process. And he asked me, was I willing to take that chance? So again, I didn't think I could do it for anyway, so I didn't have nothing to lose. I thought worst case scenario, I would have a Juris Doctorate and I'll be able to find me a job with, with that degree. So I decided to take on that and to try to become an attorney. Now my next step after graduating from ECC was again to a four year. Now again at this time I got a wife and three kids at this time. And so I'm working driving a wheelchair van maybe 50, 60 hours a week while I'm going to ECC. I graduated from ECC with a 3.7 GPA and I applied to UB and guess what? They wouldn't let me in because of my felony. So I had Dr. Grabner write some letters for me, make some phone calls, and again, they had to put my admission in front of a committee. Finally, they came back, and again, because of my felony, they admitted me into UB, but they told me that I couldn't live on campus because I was a felon. Well, it didn't matter because I didn't plan living on campus anyways. I, I had a wife and kids, my wife and kids, but still, what if I needed to live on campus? So fast forward, I graduated from UB undergrad with a 3.4 GPA, I took the LSAT and I started applying to law schools. Now, one law school in particular, Thomas Cooley, they told me because of my felony, not only would they not admit me, but they told me don't never apply again. Now, I got into other law schools. I got into Dayton Law School, a couple of law schools in New York City. But I needed to stay home at UB with my family. But I got denied. So I didn't go anywhere my, after my first year. So I was like, I'm just going to try again the next year. and reapply to UB Law School. I need to stay here with my wife and kids. So I applied again, got on the waiting list, and I got denied again. So this time, I told my wife that I needed to pursue my dream and that, and we discussed it and I was accepted to Cleveland Law School, Cleveland State. And um, we talked about it and we agreed that that would be the best thing for the family. Now this Cleveland Law School program I got into was I had to take a class in the summertime before the regular classes. And so when I called there, they said, we have housing for you, and you just need to take this one class, and then you see you do with this one class, and then you can start in the, in the fall. Now, of course, again, when I send in the application for the housing in Cleveland, what do you think they told me? You're a felon. You can't live here. So I stayed in hotels, motels, holiday inns, <laughs> wherever I could. And I drove back that, I, that, one, that 90 west and east back and forth probably five, six times a week. And because of that, my first semester, and because I couldn't afford an apartment, I just drove back and forth. Um, my grades suffered. And I think my first semester in Cleveland State, I got three C's and two D's. 
And so my whole thing was I, I wanted to do well enough in Cleveland to get back to UB as a transfer student. But I, after that first semester, I was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to transfer. And then my second semester, I did pretty well. I think I got like two or three A's and two B's the second semester. But I just knew transferring back to UB was going to be over because of that first semester. But then I was blessed to get an internship with someone I could not believe was going to let me be her intern. And I remember going to the interview, had my resume, and I said, how am I going to convince this judge who puts people in the jail for a living that me as a convicted felon should be her intern? But she saw past that. And I want to publicly thank Judge Ogden. And she's been in my corner ever since. And I applied again to UB as a transfer student. And I think they just probably let me in so they wouldn't piss her off. <laughs> and once I got into UB, I did pretty well. Um, I was elected the president of the Black Law Student Association. And I graduated. And um, I took the bar, and I actually failed the bar the first time by three points. But then I took it again, and I passed it. And then the moment had arrived, character and fitness. I was scared. Scared. And I had my little hand Bible, and I sat there, and it was probably about maybe 80 to 100 people in the room. And I was like, I knew they was going to call me last because I got issues. <laughs> and, and I believe it was about four or five people in the room. And they finally called my name. And the guy interviewed me one-on-one, -on -one, and I was ready for every question he was going to ask me. Every time I've been arrested, every, this, every, because I think I've been arrested a good, at least a good 10 times. So I had an answer for every time I got arrested. And, and I came into the room, and, and I had my bar application. I had letters of recommendation from my pastor, um, from New York State Assemblywoman Crystal Peoples, um, from other judges. And um, I was just waiting for this guy to just to grill me. And he first thing he asked me was, he said, um, who's your pastor? I was like, OK, this is a trick question. <laughs> is he really trying to think, see if I really go to church or not? So I told him who my pastor was. And I was like, why you ask? He was like, oh, your pastor, he wrote a very compelling letter about you. And I'm like, yeah. And I was like, well, you know, I take responsibility for all my past wrongs. And I started going to my spiel. He was like, the Arthur, I didn't ask you that. He was like, you're the example of someone I believe has changed their life. And I'm going to recommend to the rest of the committee that you be admitted to the New York State Bar. But because you have a felony, I think you're going to have to go in front of the whole committee. So I said, OK. So he told me to go sit back in the room. And there was three other people there. And there was this guy behind me talking to this other guy, talking about that he had a disorderly conduct arrest while he was in law school and he, that he was worried about. And I just wanted to turn around and just smack him. <laughs> And I'm like, if only this guy knew what I'm worried about. <laughs> so lo and behold, five minutes later, the same individual 
and I wish I knew who this guy was. And um, he comes to me and he asks, yes, the Arthur, come back in the room. So I'm like, okay, here it is. I'm about to get grilled. They're going to put the hot light on me and ask me all these questions and there's everything. And instead of taking me back to the rest of to the, where the rest of the committee was, he took me back in the same room. And he said, The Arthur, you're good. Go on home. What was that? <laughs> you're good. The committee talked about you and we voted to admit you. Go on home. He was like, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> You couldn't say goodbye. I, I was. I don't know if you've ever been in that building on Main Street, that elevator is so slow. I was trying to get on that elevator so fast before they'd be like, no, hold on, we, we missed something, come back. <laughs> but they didn't, and I was admitted into practice, and as um, Judge Scretney told you, um, earlier this year, he welcomed me into the federal, federal court. And my sponsoring attorney that sponsored me to be admitted into federal practice was my defense attorney when I got sentenced for Judge Scretney, Anthony Lana. So this was just a total, total 180 or 360, however you want to put it. Um, so it's, it's been a journey, a long journey. And you know what I mean? Not to mention the times that I didn't think I could do anything with my life. And there were certain things I didn't try. So what do we take from my speech today? You students out there, if I can graduate from law school at the age of 43, as a felon with a wife and four kids. You cannot give me an excuse of not excelling in life. Because I don't want to hear it. I mean, this is not the time or the place. I haven't told you half the stuff that I went through in the streets. And even after, I was trying to straighten my life. I thought karma was going to set in. I remember I was waiting to see if I got into law school. And I was waiting, and I was working that week here. And I had this white guy spit on me and call me a nigga. And if I would have retaliated, I wouldn't be here. It was another time when one of my friends got killed, and this is after I straightened my life. I went to a party, and I tried to break up a fight, trying to be the good guy. And one guy swung over my head and knocked a plate of food out of my hand, and I jumped over to the left to avoid the food. And everybody on the right got shot. My brother got shot. One of my closest friends got killed. And my cousin got shot in the shoulder. Again, no excuses. I'm expecting great things from you guys. I want to see you down the line. If you like the Arthur, I was at your speech. And Judge Scretney's program, and I'm a lawyer now. I'm a doctor now. I'm a psychologist now. That's what I want to see. That's what I want to hear. And lastly, I just hope, and there's a lot of individuals here that can make that phone call, that can write that letter of recommendation, that you can see me as an example that someone that sold drugs in the city of Buffalo can change his life and be a very productive citizen. And after properly vetting them, you won't hesitate to make that phone call. 
write that letter of recommendation to give somebody a second chance because we deserve second chances. Thank you. Arthur, thank you very much. Young ladies and gentlemen, there is a lesson uh, to be learned. Not much more that can be said about the Arthur and what he just told you. But it is the United States Constitution that made the Arthur's journey possible. It was, however, the Arthur who made success a reality. So what do we have to take out of this? We need, after today, and after your discussions this afternoon, to keep this inspirational lesson premised in the 14th Amendment close to all of our minds, souls, and hearts. And what will happen is what the Arthur has wished for, that all of us, all of you in particular, will have a fair opportunity to be eminently successful in whatever you choose. But you have to do it. Nobody else can do it for you. But our Constitution guarantees that you can do it. Thank you to all that participated. The Arthur, thank you for those, again, inspirational words. Ms. Lapisato, what do you have to say? Court is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we will adjourn to the jury assembly room, lunch. The judges will join you at your respective tables. Think of some good questions. Uh, we'll try to have some good answers for you.